All right, I am back here talking tennis here, getting ready for the U.S. Open next week with the host of the No Challenges Remaining podcast, Ben Rothenberg. Ben, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me, Mike. I got to say, I'm a big tennis fan. All I will admit, I have not been paying too much attention to the tennis world since the tour shut down for the pandemic. What is, I mean, I heard obviously about the Adria tour and the positive COVID test that came from it. What are some other things that have been happening while the tennis world's kind of been getting ready for the tours to restart? Oh, there's been a lot of sort of, um, a lot of debates about when it would come back. Wimbledon canceled pretty early in the process. I guess it's probably the major event. The French Open decided pretty early on also that it was going to move from its, uh, its late May, early June date to be relocated in late September, early October. Uh, so that's a, a pretty big shift in the calendar and a bunch of events have followed that. So it's kind of a mad scramble and then a bunch of smaller exhibition events popped up, none of which turned out anywhere near as disastrously as the, uh, the Djokovic Adria tour. And yeah, so, uh, it's, it's been an interesting time. Every player, unlike the, uh, team sports which are coming back every player in tennis is making his and her own decisions about what they're going to do if they feel comfortable playing at this time what kind of schedule they're going to play if they're going to play these exhibition events or not so it's been a pretty pretty scattered scattered spot so far it's been kind of all over the place yeah it definitely has and the big thing that's going to start next week like as we're reco- as on this podcast releases is that the there's the U.S. Open quarter, quarter bubble is going to be beginning with the Cincinnati Western, like uh, Western Southern Open events they brought to New York for this year, and then the U.S. Open the two weeks after that. So it's gonna be interesting, I think, to see how these players look after this long of competitive layoff. Yeah, we've had a little bit of a sample on the WTA. WTA had three smaller tournaments come back on the side, and kind of un, not some common tour stop. They play one in, in Sicily, and then one in Prague, and then one in Kentucky, and a lot of them look pretty decent. I mean, a lot of a lot of the competition was good. But some, of them, some of them look pretty rough, though. And it's going to be, I think, it's going to be a, a pretty wide range of readiness because whether it's people just feeling, uh, you know, emotionally, mentally ready to, to be training full bore during a pandemic, and not everyone's going to be that way, especially when the when the return date for support was so uncertain. And then also, it's going to be a question of if. You know, various people had access to things. If there are local clubs there, there are training facilities wherever were even open. If they plan public facilities that were somehow shut down by the government, so it's going to be a, a wide range of preparation. I think the top end of it will be pretty good, but the lower end could be pretty scratchy for a lot of players, which I can't really blame them for in this, in this situation. Yeah, I was going to be fascinating to see how some of these tennis players adapt to the bubble environment for the first time, especially at the U.S. Open, which I go to every year when it's when it's physically allowed to and. The environment there is just so different, and especially at a night session at Arthur Ashe, and the fans get so into it. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how some of these top players adjust to not having that momentum from the crowd to carry them through some of these tough points. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think it's got to be a bit of an equalizer where, you know, nobody's used to these current conditions, whereas someone like Serena Williams is used to having, especially in recent years, really, really vocal crowd work behind her all the time that, that rallies her and also can intimidate the opponent, I think, see how many people are, are rooting for the other outcome besides you winning. So they won't have as much to block out on that thing. So that, that could be an equalizer for the lower rank players, for sure. Um, it's it's going to be weird, though, for sure. It's not going to... The U.S. Open is so known for its, its noise and its electricity, they say, and its, its fans and its, its rowdiness of, by tennis standards. And it's uh, it's not going to have any of that right now. So it, it's going to be a very, very different feeling U.S. Open, for sure. Yeah, it will be for sure. I also think it's going to feel different because like so many of like the top players, especially on the women's side, either opted, opted not to play for virus concerns or due to injury concerns. And the men's side, too, also doesn't have Rafael Nadal or Roger Federer. So you're, like you're going to have a lot of room for some new faces to emerge and get, get towards the top, close to the top of the tournament. Yeah, definitely. I mean, from the relevance factor, I think six of the women's top ten are out currently, which is, it feels like about the same as losing Federer and Nadal. Uh, I mean, those guys are worth maybe even more than six of the top ten in terms of relevance on the men's side. Uh, so they, between them and Djokovic, Djokovic kind of because this big three air has been so they've been so uh, greedy in their dominance of it, or so unyielding in their dominance of the, of the tour right now. I do think that uh, yeah, Djokovic kind of has the place to himself in terms of clear favorites right now. But he, but we haven't seen him play in a long time in meaningful tennis, so we don't know how prepared he is. And what his what his mental state is going to be like or anything like that. Yeah, I want to go to Novak for a minute because I talked to John Wertheim, I think back in June, and he speculated that this would be a spot for Novak to try and come and basically steal a slam in the, in the goat race. And 
it's interesting to see because obviously he's had coronavirus. He's recovered from it. This is the first like real big event he's going to play after Cincinnati. And I think it will be fascinating to see like what he looks like. He's also another one who thrives on the crowd supporting him in New York. And I do think it'll be interesting to see how he adapts this environment. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to see. I, I think that he's somebody who has been a pretty controversial figure in, in tennis during this time. I, I think that he's, he was one who organized the Adria Tour and got a lot of flack for that when it imploded. And just this, even before it imploded, honestly, just this general sort of uh, disdain they showed for any sort of social distancing protocols and things like that during during the pandemic uh, and how much that blew up in their faces. Uh, so he's gotten a lot of, he's actually maybe somebody who's potentially happy not to be around fans right now. Cause I think the public perception to Djokovic could have been pretty dicey at the moment. Um, so, so we'll see. It, it, he's definitely, definitely the leader of, of the list contenders. And then the big, big drop off their hand. But after, if, if, if it's not Djokovic, it could be one of them, a big handful of people. I think. Yeah. On the men's side, like let's put Djokovic aside a second. Like who else do you think like is the big opportunity for, because a lot of it, we've seen like the big three really dominate the slams and, you're guaranteed by very sure of the draw that somebody not named Federer and Nadal is going to be in that final. So, like, who do you think could really step up and make a big name for themselves here? Yeah, the obvious pick is Daniel Medvedev, who made the final last year and actually played pretty well in the final against Rafael Nadal. Uh, he was the informed player on the U.S. Hard Courts last summer. And so he's the, the clear pick, I think, this time. But then if it's not him, but we also haven't seen him play at all, so we have no idea how he's, he's looking or anything. And then uh, Sasha Zverev has been a you know, long time talk about players been hanging around the top five for a bit. Stefano Sitsipas also in that range. Go down a little bit further. Dominic Team, I think he's probably also talked about, although he's probably, he's probably focusing more energy on the placements coming up. So we'll see. It, it's tough to know really how they're all going to look and how they're all going to ha- handle, especially for the men, handle best of five coming off of this, uh, this long of a layoff and have played in this Cincinnati event right the week before. It's going to be a very different physical test than it has been in the past. Month. Yeah, I think CC Pass, the guy I'm curious to watch because I feel like his name's been on the tip of people's tongues for a while, and like he's really sort of been in that tier right below the Medvedevs and the Zverevs of the world. I feel like this might be his spot where he sort of like takes that big leap forward. Yeah, no, absolutely. He, he's somebody who has, has had pretty consistent training. He's been based at the Mortaglou Academy in France during. During this stoppage time, so he's somebody who I think would come with high expectations and won't mind again the veteran at all not being there, even if he has beaten each of them in his career. Yeah, I'll go to the women's side for a minute. I do think that the biggest thing that this tournament's had going for it was the fact that Serena Williams committed early. I don't think I think if she didn't, it would have been a harder sell to the USDA to try and put it together. And I know she's been vocal in how much she believes in the protocols and how much she wants to get out there and we know that she's been chasing that record tying slam for a long time. What do you think about Serena's odds of trying to get it here? Serena, yeah, I think Serena is very in. Also, she's notable among the players because she's somebody who's had lung health issues. That's not exactly what you asked. But she's had, someone has, has had lung health issues in the past. Her blood pops in her lungs have been pretty uh, life threatening. And so she's somebody who I think really, really genuinely takes all the rules and regulations around the pandemic seriously. She does not want any part of coronavirus. But still, she's playing. Uh, and she's going to be, once again, the focus at a grand slam, the way she always is when she's in the draw. Uh, and she has to like her chances here. I mean, she's subtracting a couple players who've beaten her in the grand slam finals lately, uh, including Andrescu and Angela Kerber, can't hurt her her optimism, and she's going to have a much higher seed than she would had it been a full draw. So uh, Serena has to be seen this as yet another good chance to get 24, and, and we'll see. I mean, we, again, we don't have a lot of data on Serena. She played in Kentucky and lost in the quarterfinals. Looks okay, uh, but she's obviously not planning to peak in Kentucky. She's trying to speak to the U.S. Open, so she's definitely, I think, as always, in recent years, a player to beat. She isn't winning anything. Yeah, she is another player. I think she could get a lot of attention. I think the layoff might help her just because, like, she has because as her age and she's obviously really playing a little bit more than she did now. I think seeing how Coco Gauff does in her second U.S. Open is gonna be fascinating. Oh yeah, golf is, golf is definitely somebody who I think actually it's very plausible for a long list contender to win this tournament. I think that golf uh, has been trending in all the right directions the whole time. She made fourth round of the Australian Open this year, beating Amanda Saka in the third round to get there before losing to the eventual champ uh, Kennan. So yeah, golf is definitely somebody who uh, should be taken very seriously at this tournament. But her ranking still not being that far until the top fifty. Yeah, that's for sure. And who are some of the other women's contenders you think can make some noise here? Well, the top seed is going to be number three, Carolina Pliskova. She's 
is a number top two pulled out, and she's made the final before. Uh, it's it's tough enough because we really haven't seen any of them play. So that's usually usually I take you know predictions for Grand Slam a lot more based off of who this momentum from this form things like that. And there's really not much of that to go off of. Uh, Jen Brady is an American from Pennsylvania. She won the uh, Kentucky tournament that was held last week, and so I think maybe she has momentum as far as you can count it. And she's been playing really well as well. So I, I think she would be a, not a surprise at all to at least make it to the second week of the tournament and make a good run uh, if her draw works out. So, you know, we'll see. I it, it, It's a lot of unknowns still. It, it's tough, to, especially women's tennis, it's already had a lot of parity to begin with. It's tough to really be confident about anybody or to really rule out anybody at this stage. Yeah, I think one I'm keeping my eye on, too, is uh, the champion from 2018, Naomi Osaka. I think that she also yeah. is kind of flying a little under the radar here. I think she could make some noise again. Oh, absolutely. I mean, she's somebody who I, I'm not sure how focused her training has been during this time. She's been very active in a lot of stuff. Uh, she went to Minnesota to protest after the, the George, after George Floyd's death and has been generally taking up a lot of other sort of uh, issues and passions with her during during this time. So she's somebody who I have a little bit of concern about what her training level is like. I mean, that's unfair. I'm not sure, but I really have no idea. Uh, but yeah, but she's somebody who absolutely has the uh, has the, the game to make them know, especially in this uh, relatively vacated field. Yeah, I do too. If if you like, if you had to pick today and you had to say, here who I think I will win the Open, who would you go with? I mean, I would be lazy and just go with Serena and Djokovic. I, I would hope that their experience would prevail in this time, but I, I say that with just not knowing anything. I, I think there's going to be so many, so many unknowns and, and in a lot of different ways. We're not going to really know how to how to feel about this U.S. Open until it starts. Maybe maybe a couple rounds into it, I'll get a better bearing for how different or how not different it all feels. But but right now, I don't have a, a high degree of certainty in predicting anything in the in the world. I guess much less uh, in, a, in a sport that already has, has so much surprising results. In tennis. Yeah, I think one other story I want to track for the U.S. Open specifically is I want to. I, I'm curious to see how Andy Murray looks as a wild card in the singles draw because mm-hmm. I'm I, I'm always rooting for him. I always. Found that he was a very good guy, very fun player to root for. I want to. I hope he can may, maybe win around here. I know he's not a big threat to go deep anymore. I'd like to see what he does. Yeah, no, he, and he's actually somebody who I think the layoff would have helped a tremendous amount, getting more time to get in shape, more time to heal his injury, uh, more time to. Get, his, his conditioning was always always pretty good, but he's somebody who I think will have really used this time to his benefit. And, uh, pretty eager to play in New York, and he's somebody absolutely who could, who could go on and run with the right kind of draw. Too. I think he can probably beat a, a peak Djokovic or maybe one of those other three, four guys. He's like a fifth pass or a team, probably not. But I, I do think that he's somebody who can make life difficult for a lot of people. And as long as his health holds up, and again, it's tough playing best of five right now for him. But uh, I think that it, he could he could definitely make himself pretty proud. Yeah, that's for sure. And last question for you. We're talking again to Ben Rothberger, the No Challengers Remaining Tennis Podcast. Obviously, like the calendar change we mentioned at the top with the French Open coming basically like a couple of weeks after the U.S. Open. I feel like it's a big turnaround and we've a very quick turnaround. We've seen that like, Rafael Nadal specifically has pointed himself towards the French that have come into New York. Do you think that the quick turnaround from what from hardcore to gra- to clay is really going to hurt the people who come here as opposed to people who are staying over in Europe to get ready for the French? You know, I don't know. It's going to have risks and rewards for everybody because if you play your stuff and you'll have a lot of competition practice and, and match practice and high intensity level, poor level tennis practice, which might count for more than being on the acidic surface more. So it, it could go either way. I could really make a case for either. Um, yeah, Nadal, I assume it's playing the French Open. He pulled out of the US Open for travel reasons, but he still would have to travel technically to get to the French Open. We'll see. I mean, the French Open is. Still, they still have a lot of things undecided about. They haven't had the clear sort of delineation of their rules and their bubble the way the U.S. Open has. So we don't know. It, it, it's tough to, as, as unknown as the U.S. Open is being a week out, the French Open is infinitely more being four weeks out now. So uh, we'll see. It, it, it's going to be a whole different uh, kettle of uh, kettle of bad guests or something over there. Yeah, I know the French Open is still. I think mean, they were still evading whether or not to actually have fans at their stadium, at their at their courts there. Yeah, I, I don't even it's, considering the amount of trouble that the U.S. is having getting fans in the buildings here. I would be surprised if the if the French government lets them do this. Yeah, I mean what they're saying is, and this is what we heard the Asia tour that like Europe is doing better with the pandemic, but 
uh, you know, I, I think the way to start getting more work with the pandemic is start having big public sporting events. So I, I don't, I, I, I think the fans, it's a terrible idea. Uh, they're talking about having, they're talking about having the cops to like, I don't know, 50% capacity at the, at the tournament, maybe more than that, which is still 10, like 10,000 something fans there. So that's, that's way too much. I, I don't like that idea at all. Um, and I know there's, there's always changing government restrictions, what you can and can't do. And, uh, it seems like they are going to, uh, go ahead. So I don't know what the fan end of it is going to be. Ultimately, the, uh, Rome tournament, which is happening between the US Open and the French Open, they just got rid of their fans or they just announced they have no fans. So I have to think the French Open will follow too. It just doesn't, I don't make any kind of sense to have a, any real number of fans. That they don't know yeah, I'm excited to see how the end of the tennis year plays out. It'll be a very different thing for sure. Ben Rothenberg, thanks for all the times. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, how can people find you on social media and, and keep up with your podcast? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my podcast is uh, at NCR underscore tennis on Twitter. Probably best way to find us. And thank you for having me, Mike. I appreciate it. It's fun. All right, and there you have it. That was Ben Rothenberg from the NCR Tennis Podcast talking a little U.S. Open. We'll do a little more U.S. Open later in the week, but up next, we are going to go to the movies with the great John Stanko right after this. <laughs> 